Okay, we're on the very top of Daf Yudalit Omid Aleph. We had learned yesterday that the measurement of a kora has to be one tefach wide, enough to support the thickness of a brick, which is called an ariach, which is one and a half tefachim. So there seems to be an inconsistency. If it's supposed to be able to seat a one and a half tefach wide brick, then why does it only have to be one tefach wide? It should be one and a half tefachim. So the Gemara will tell us. The Gemara says, Tefach, Tefach umechzeboi. Why do you tell me it's only got to be a Tefach wide? It's got to be a Tefach and a half wide. So, Kevin Derach of Lekabel Tefach, Ida Chatsi Tefach, Malbin Lei Betina, Mashuhu Mehagisa, Umashuhu Mehagisa. Explains the Gemara very simply is that since it's got a one Tefach width, then you could take the brick and let it, o- let it o- go over the sides just a little bit. It's like basically. Um, a quarter of a tefach on either side it's going over and you could affix it with a little bit of uh, mortar, cement, whatever it is and that's sufficient. We don't require the kora to seat the full width of the brick just enough so that it will remain secure sitting on the brick the kaima, and it'll be able to stay there. So if it's exactly the same width, if it was a tefach, then you wouldn't have to be worried about fixing it? I mean, uh, a little bit over and the edge, what are they so worried about? That it's going to fall up. Or it says, yeah. it, you know, just it, it, it's theoretically possible to affix it that way, I guess. Amar Rabba Bar Rav Huna, Kora Sha'amru, Shricha Shetehe Beria Kedei Lekabel Ariach, Umamide Kora, Enan Shrichin Shu Beria Kedei Lekabel Kora Ve Ariach. Now remember, we saw Machlokes in our Gemar, in our Mishnah between the Chachamim and Rabbi Yehuda. The Chachamim had said that the Kora has to be sturdy enough to support the weight of the brick. And Rabbi Yehuda says, no, it doesn't have to be sturdy enough. It just has to be wide enough. Now, according to the Chachamim, they said that the kora itself has to be sturdy enough. So let's say you have a kora that's made out of a, a, a strong material like wood. But the supports of the kora, let's say you only affixed, let's say something that's like a broomstick, you affixed it to the walls of the mavoi with a very, very uh, light kind of epoxy, which is not going to really remain standing if you put a lot of weight on top of that stick. So even though the stick is sturdy enough to support the brick, but if the supports of the stick are not sturdy enough to support it, um, he says that's okay. You don't need the supports of the Korah to be sturdy enough because there's not really a Korah, it's uh, not really an Ariach, there's not really a brick there, we're just imagining a brick. And Rav Chista disagrees, and he says, no, according to the Chachamim, it has to be so sturdy, not only this, the Korah itself has to be sturdy, but the supports of the Korah have to also be sturdy enough so that if you Mamish did put a brick down there, the Korah would not collapse. So Rav Shesha says an important principle. He says that what if a person were to drape a mat or a blanket, let's say, or a sheet, he were to drape it over the kora, and he says, gee, this is great, this is even much better than just having a kora. I'm putting like a curtain at the entrance to my mavoi. The only problem is, is that the curtain does not go down all the way to the ground. It's elevated above the ground three tvachim. So Rav Sheshe says, you think you may have done something great, but you've actually ruined it. You have no, neither a kora, nor do you have a partition. The reason is, is because kora in kan da hamichasya, mechitza in kan da habila mechitza shagadi bokimba. He says, you don't have a kora anymore because you've covered it over, so no one can see it. So you've removed the efficacy of having that recognizable symbol to remind you. And furthermore, you don't have a partition because the partition has to go down to the ground. If the partition is elevated above the ground three tfachim, this now becomes a partition that animals can crawl under, and that's no longer halachically called a partition. If the goats can crawl under the, the, the fence, it's not a fence. Okay, Tanu Rabban and Korah, Hayotza Mikosel Zeh, Veinu Naagaz Bekosel Zeh, Vechein Shtei Koros, Echas Yotza Mikosel Zeh, Veechas Yotza Mikosel Zeh, Veinu Nogo Zubazu. So the following two scenarios. Scenario number one is where you have a stick, but it's only attached to one of the two walls of the Mavoy, and it's, it's, um, it's suspended in midair. So let's say you took a broomstick and you drilled a hole into the, one of the Mavoy walls, and you stuck it in there, and it doesn't extend all the way to the other wall. It's just hanging there. 
Another scenario is you, you got two broomsticks, one that you stick into one wall, the one you stick into the other wall, but there's a gap in between the two. So you don't have a, full, a fully contiguous Korah. So the Gemara, the, the Gemara says, Pachos mishlosha in tzarech lahavi Korah acheres. Shlosha tzarech lahavi Korah acheres. Here we apply the principle of lovud that anything that is within three tvachim of each other is considered to be connected. So therefore, if there's less than three tvachim of airspace in both of those scenarios that I mentioned in the gap, so then it's okay. It's considered to be connected. But if it's more than three tvachim, so then, so then you've got problems and you have to supplement the Korah with some other Korah. Rabbin Shimon ben Gamliel Omer Pachos Midalad Ein Tzarech Lahavi Korah Acheres Arba Tzarech Lahavi Korah Acheres And Rabbin Shimon ben Gamliel says that I disagree with the rule of Lavud. You say that the rule of Lavud is three Tvachim or less. I hold that the rule of Lavud is four Tvachim or less. Okay, and so, or, or within, or, or within four Tvachim, I should say. So, so would he hold the same in the previous? Yes, he would. Yes, that's an excellent point. The answer is, is we're good. the Gemara is going to clarify this, is that even Rav Shimon Gamliel, who says that, the, that love, he's more liberal with lovehood, he still agrees that when it comes to creating a mechitza, it has to be such that animals cannot get, get under it. And so that's got nothing to do with lovehood, that's got to do with the fact that it's not considered a mechitza, it's not considered a wall or something that is touching the ground. Okay. V'chein beis koros hamas imos lo bezu k'dei l'kabal ariach, v'lo bezu k'dei l'kabal ariach. Now let's take a look at the next case. Let's say you have two sticks. Instead of one stick, neither, you, have, you have two sticks that are parallel to each other, that are running across the top of the Mavoy entrance. They're mamish right next to each other, just, just, just like that, okay? And neither one is wide enough to support uh, that brick that we talked about, the one and a half tefach brick. So im mikablos ariach lorach botefach ein sarach lahavi korach cheres im lav sarach lahavi korach cheres. So the Tanakama is of the opinion is that if between the two of them they could support this one and a half tefach brick along its along its width of one and a half tefachim, so then you're okay because you look at it as if they're the two of them are sort of like one big stick, and therefore they're okay. And if not, then then it's not going to work. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, and basically what we're learning over here is a chiddush that according to the Tanakhama, the Korah that has to be one tefach wide does not have to be fully solid. It could be empty in the center as long as the two ends of it would be end, end up being able to support the weight of a um, uh, and, uh, and the space of a, of a, of a of an ariach. But Rabbi Shimon Gamliel Omer in the Kablos ariach lo orko shlosha ein sarach lahavi Korah acheres in lab sarach lahavi Korah acheres. Rabbi Shimon Gamliel is more machmir, and he says, no, <coughs> it sounds like to me that he's more machmir, but it could be I'm mistaken. He says, look, the brick that we're talking about is one and a half tfachim wide and three tfachim long. So the sticks have to be able to support the weight such that they could support a much a longer brick. So they have to be wider apart. They have to be wider apart such that you could place a, the length of the brick, which is three tfachim long, on top of the two sticks, and the two sticks would support it. If, that, if that's the case, then, then it'll be a good Korah, uh, because Rabbi Shimon Gamliel requires that when you have a non, the width of the Korah is non-contiguous, it has to be more distant from each other to support a larger space, a larger, uh, I guess that would for him be more recognizable since they're a little bit more distant from each other. That's what I'm assuming. Do, do they, they hold that the, the space fills in, like uh, we said before, if something is within three tefachim of another object? Uh, so I don't know if we're applying the principle of lovehood here or not. Uh -huh. It's not clear to me. I, it's not clear to me that we're applying the principle of lovehood because Korah has to do with recognizability. And recognizability has to do with the, uh, the view of the eye, not the, halachic physical, the physical halachic status. It's a perception issue, right? And so that's why I'm, I'm thinking that the machlokas between the Chacham and Rishim and Gamliel is what is more perceptible to the, to the human eye. And that may have nothing to do with love. So it's not clear to me. I, I readily admit this re requires more analysis, but at least something to think about. Okay. Um, now, what if you have two koros that are parallel to each other, but one is higher than the other? So, therefore, not only do you not have the two sticks connected, but they're not in, in, in vertically 
adjacent to each other, one is higher than the other. So then the way it works is like this. Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda, Omer, Rowan, Esa, Eliona, Ki'ilu, Hilomata, Tachtona, Ki'ilu, Hilomala, Ovovat, Shalot, Tehe, Eliona, Lomayla, Michaf, Amma, Betachtona, Lomata, Measara. So Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda says it'll work as because what we can do is we do this imaginary thought experiment and we lower the higher one and we raise the lower one so that we imagine them as being parallel to each other vertically and as long as they're adjacent to each other uh, in our minds and it would support a brick with the two of them together so then it's okay even though currently they're like this if we can imagine them like if we're standing if you're standing right beneath them and you look up you cannot tell the depth that one is higher and one is lower and that's okay because as, again it has to do with visual perception and therefore if, they, if we could imagine them mamish adjacent to each other as supporting a brick then it'll work provided that what provided that the higher Korah is not higher than 20 amas because that's the maximal measurement for a Korah and provided that the lower one is not lower than 10 Tvachim which is the minimal height of a, of a Korah you better use an imaginary brick or it'll slide off <laughs> right it's got to be imaginary exactly so you can cement it um, so Amar Abaye Rabbi Yosi Rabbi Yehuda Savar Laki Avua Bechado Polagalei Bechada. So Rabbi Yosi Rabbi Yehuda says uh, Abaye says Rabbi Yosi Rabbi Yehuda. He's the son of Rabbi Yehuda, right? Rabbi Yehuda is actually mentioned twice. Once in the mission that we just learned yesterday, and also once in the very first mission of Maseches Erevin. And he says he holds like his father in one respect and disagrees with his father in another respect. Savar Laki Avua Bechada Di Islei Rowan. He agrees with his father Rabbi Yehuda in our Mishnah who says that even though the Korah is very flimsy, you imagine as if it's made out of a more sturdy material. So he says he agrees with the concept of using your imagination, right? But he disagrees with his father in one respect. That Rabbi Yehuda, if you recall back in the very first mission in Erevin, Rabbi Yehuda was of the opinion that even if the Korah is higher than 20, it could still be kosher. And here, Rabbi Yosef Rabbi Yehuda says, no, if the higher Korah is higher than 20, then it's not going to work. So you see, he disagrees with his father as far as the maximal measurement of 20. So that's just the, an observation that Abaya makes, is that sometimes you find a Tana who subscribes in one respect, but does not subscribe in the other respect. Next, Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Rechava Afal Pisha Eina Beria. Rabbi Yehuda had disagreed with the Tana Kama. The Tana Kama had said, you need both the requisite width of the Korah, Plus, you need the requisite sturdiness of the Korah to support a brick. Uh, Rabbi Yehuda disagrees. He says, all you need is the requisite width. You don't need the requisite sturdiness. So, Masni Le Rav Yehuda, Lechia Barav Kamei De Rav, Rechava, Afal Pisha in a Berea. Now, Rabbi Yehuda taught the, the Mishnah, uh, quoting Rabbi Yehuda as saying, that the Korah has to be wide even if it's not sturdy and that's sufficient and Amr Lay and Chia Barav um, when he, I'm sorry, Rav, when he hears this he says, Asniye Rechava Uberia Rav says no, that even according to Rabbi Yehuda you need the brick to be both sturdy and, uh, and wide now the question of course now is well then what's the machlokas between Rabbi Yehuda and the Chachamim if Rabbi Yehuda also requires both width and sturdiness, then they seem to be saying the same thing. And this is what Tosus discusses, but at, at least according to Rav, he's saying that no, everybody requires both width and sturdiness. So the Gemara now says, the Hama Rebbe Eloi, Hama Rav Rechava, Arba Ako Pisha in a I but didn't, wasn't Rav quoted by Rebbe Eloi as saying is that if you have a Korah that's four Tvachim wide, then it doesn't have to be sturdy. So how can Rav insist upon sturdiness? The Gemara answer is Rechava Arba'a Shaini. When it's four Tvachim wide, then we agree that you don't need it doesn't need to be sturdy. But if it's only a Tefach wide, then it has to be sturdy enough to support the weight of a brick. Next, Haisa Shalkash Kulei. After Rabbi Yehuda had stated that it doesn't have to have the requisite sturdiness to support a brick, he then gives, goes ahead and gives various examples. And he says that if it's made out of straw or out of flimsy sticks, it's still going to be kosher as long as it's a tefach wide. So the Gemara says, My kamash malan, the amrinan rowin, hainu hach. So the Gemara says, what was the purpose of bringing these examples? To tell me that we can use our imagination? Well, he already told us that. So what does he have to bring these examples? The Gemara says, Mahu detema b'mina amrinan shlo b'mina lo amrinan kamash malan. You might have thought, says the Gemara, 
that when Rebbe Yehuda says that you can use your imagination, it's only when you're dealing with a material that the Korah is made out of, it, it, as such a material that you can make this material into something sturdy under normal conditions. But let's say you're using a material that is never sturdy. Maybe there Rebbe Yehuda would agree that you don't say Ro and that you don't use your imagination, and therefore the Korah is not kosher. So let's say we were talking about a wooden Korah, just that the wooden Korah is paper thin. So maybe there Rebbe Yehuda would say that even though it's not sturdy, it's still kosher because Lemaise are using a sturdy material, but it just so happens that this particular Korah is not sturdy. But let's say you were using straw. Now, straw is never sturdy, no matter how much you... you could make it strong. You well, you could. In theory, you could make it strong. But in most situations, straw is considered to be a flimsy material. And therefore, you might have thought that there, Rabbi Huda would agree that it's not kosher. So that's why Rabbi Huda wants to make a point of saying that even straw, which is never made into a sturdy uh, kind of support, uh, can still be used as a korah. Akuma rowan osaki iluhi pishuta. Another example that Rabbi Huda had given is that if it's curved, if the kora is curved, and therefore because of its curvature, it cannot support a brick which is straight, you nevertheless imagine the kora as being straight, and therefore it, it, it could, in your imagination, support a, a, an ariach, and therefore it's kosher. If we know that straw is not considered a strong material, then the uh, test of the brick is irrelevant, because we know it's not going to hold. No, Rabbi Huda had said, you look, you imagine the straw as if it's made out of metal. You ma that's, that's what the Mishnah had stated. As long as it's wide, as long as it's wide enough, then you imagine that it's made out of a very strong, a dense material, and therefore it's kosher. So the Gemara now says, this too is pshita. The Gemara says, if, you, if Rabbi Huda had already, has already acknowledged that we use the principle of Rowan, which is we can use our imagination to twist and turn and reshape and reform, and reassign mass, so then why do you need to give me this specific example of where you have a curved or bent uh, Korah? The Gemara says, Kamash Malan Kedar Rebbe Zeira, Dama Rebbe Zeira, He Besoch HaMavoy Ve'akmu Misa Chutz Lamavoy, He Besoch Esrim Ve'akmu Misa Lamayla Me Esrim, He Lamayla Me Asara Ve'akmu Misa Lamata Me Asara, Ro'in Kol Sheilu Yinatel Akmu Misa Ve'in Ba Lazesh Losha, Ein Tzarech Lahavi Korah Acheres, Ve'in Lav Tzarech Lahavi Korah Acheres. So the, Rabbi Zera taught us a very interesting <coughs> halacha. If you have a curvature in the Korah to such, in, in such a way where the majority of the Korah is inside the Mavoy, but the curvature curves, curves um, horizontally going outwards so that a portion of the Korah is jutting out into the Rishus Arabim. So then, or another, there's two other examples that Rabbi Zera gives. Another example is where it's curved or, or bent vertically, such that the majority of the kora is within 20 amos, but the bent part bends upward so that a portion of the kora is above 20 amos. The third example that Rebbe Zera gives is where you have a low kora, which is just above 10 tvachim high, and a portion of the kora curves downward such that a portion of the kora is dipping down into below the 10 tvachim point. So therefore, Rabbi Zera says, so what's the test to determine whether this Korah is kosher or not? If you were to imagine that portion of the Korah that is jutting out into Rishus Arabim, or above 20 Amos, or below 10 Tvachim, if you would imagine that it was gone, if you would imagine it was not there, then you would still have a space of less than 3 Tvachim to connect the two parts of the Korah that are still there, so then it's kosher. But if not... If not, if that piece was missing and you would have a gap of more than three tfachim, so then the kora is not kosher and you have to bring another stick in order to supplement it. So the Gemara says, Hanami pshita. So the Gemara says, but that too should be self-evident. If we're using our imagination, we have obviously we know that there are limitations to how to when we can apply the uh, the the, the uh, imaginary line, right? So if portion of the kora is missing. So we've already pointed out that if a portion of the Korah is missing, you use Lovid uh, to determine whether you have three Tfachim uh, or less uh, to, fill, to fill the gap. So the Gemara says, The Gemara says that the Chiddush that the Mishnah is teaching me is, in the case, the first case that Rabbi Zera had addressed, which is where the Korah 
is horizontally jutting outwards into Rosh Hashanah. In that scenario, you might have thought that even though the part that is jutting out into Rosh Hashanah is less than three tefachim wide, you would still invalidate the Korah. Why? Mahu shuche basara kamash malan. Because you, you might have thought that if a person sees that Korah, he'll follow the contour of the Korah while carrying <coughs> something. And therefore, we should prohibit it, even if it's less than a three tefachim um, uh, um, portion of it sticking out into Rosh Hashanah, because the guy's going to follow the contour of the Korah while he's carrying. So Kamash Malon know that he'll catch himself, because he'll know he'll make note of the fact that part of this is jutting out, and he'll stop before he ends up carrying outside of the Mavoy. That's the Chiddush of the Mishnah. And then the next thing that the Mishnah had said was that Agul Arona Sakilu Himiru Ba'as, that if the if the Korah is round, if it's as a circumference that's round, like a broomstick, and that's your Korah, so obviously you can't put a brick on that, it'll just roll off. So nevertheless, you view it as if, you, if, as if it's squared off, and if it's squared off such that the diameter of, this, of the broomstick is one tefach, so then it's a kosher Korah, and if not, it's, it's a non-kosher Korah. It probably will find a place to right flick. You can't. Yeah, that's the thing is you can only use your imagination because in, in physical reality it's not it's not going to be able to rest on it. So the Gemara now says hasu lamali sefer. So why do you need that? If you already told me you can use your imagination, so why do you need this example as well? The Gemara answers sefer strichale kol sheyesh behekefo gimel tefachim yesh baruch av tefach. It's coming to tell me a, a, a mathematical principle that pi is three that any time you have something with a circumference of three, you know that its diameter is one. That's the Chiddush of the Mishnah. It's telling me what pi is. And as we all know, pi is three. Now the Gemara asks, Minahanimili. So how do you know this? How do you know that pi is three? Amar of Yechon and Amar Kra, it's based on a Pasuk. It says in the Pasuk, when Shlomo built the Beis HaMikdash, Vayasis Hayam Mutzak, Eser Ba'ama Misvaso Adzvaso that Shlomo HaMelech made an above-ground pool in the temple. This was for purposes of purification. And what were the measurements of this pool? It measured 10 in diameter from one edge to the, net, to the, to the other edge at its widest point. And Agul Saviv, it was round. And V'chamesh Ba'ama Komaso, it was five amos high off the ground. V'kav Shloshim Ba'ama Yisova So Saviv. And its circumference was 30 amos. Now, if the circumference, if the diameter is 10 and the circumference is 30, you see then that pi is, is pi is 3, that the ratio of diameter to circumference is 1 to 3. So the Gemara now says, Vihaikasfaso. The Gemara's thinking is, is that if you're measuring the, from one edge to the other on the inside of the pool, then you're not taking into account the width of the wall of the pool. And you measure a circumference by measuring on a yardstick all around on the outside. So the circumference should actually be larger than 30 because you've got to take into account the width of the walls. So the Gemara says, Amar Rav Papa, Svasa, Svas, Perch, Shoshan, Ksiv Bey. That the answer is Rav Papa because the wall was the width of a, of a rose petal. It was so narrow at the top that it was, it was insignificant. And that's why the ratio is maintained. The Ksiv, the Avyo Tefach, as it says that the thickness at the bottom of the pool, w of the walls of the pool, was one tefach wide. And of course, you need to have a thicker wall. Everyone who in, is an engineer knows that the, uh, the higher or the deeper a pool of water is, the more weight is pressed onto the, the further down you go into the pool. So at the bottom of the pool, the walls needed to be thicker, they needed to be one tefach wide, that at the top, however, when we get to the top of the pool, the walls are, are, are paper thin. They're the width of a rose petal, it says. And and the pool held how much water? It held 2,000 bases. It held 2,000 two bats. We're going to see what those 2,000 bats are shortly. Now the Gemara says, but still, but even if you're going to tell me that the width of the walls at the, at the top of the pool was only the thickness of a rose petal, but still you have to reckon with that to end up with a circumference larger than 30. So the Gemara answers, Ki kachashiv mi kachashiv. The answer is, is that it's not like you thought that the circumference was being measured from the outside, 
The circumference was being measured from the inside. And that's why you get a perfect one to three ratio. Now, Tosfos points out that if the Gemara is being so exact as to say that there's going to be a slight variation of the one to three ratio if you measure the circumference from the outside of a very paper thin wall to the inside, then obviously the ratio of three to one is not just an approximation. It sounds like we're mamish being medactic, we're being very precise in saying that it's mamish one to three. And Tosfus leaves off with a question. We'll just read the question very quickly. On the bottom of <coughs> Tosfus, at the bottom of Tosfus, he says, V'kasha, de'ina cheshbon medukdak l'fi chachmei hamidot. He says the measurement is imprecise, as our geometrists tell us. As all people, uh, uh, students of geometry know, the measurement of pi is not 3. The measurement of pi is 3.141159. Uh, you keep on going. It's a, so right? why are they so concerned about a little bit of this off anyways? What? So that's the question. Why is so why is the concerned about, about that anyways? small little excess? Because it's not a precise <laughs> measurement to begin with. That's Tosus leaves off with this question. You'll have to work on it. <laughs> Tanya, Rabbi Chia, so Rabbi Chia taught the following b'risa. Yam sha'asa shlomo ha'yamachzik me'a v'chamisha mikveh taharam. So that Shlomo HaMelech, now we said that it was five amos high, ten in diameter. Okay, just remember that. Ten amos in diameter, five amos high. It was able to hold 150 kosher mikvahs. So whatever a mikvah was, multiply that by 150, and that was the volume of water that was contained in the pool. So mechdi, so now let's do the math. I hope you guys like math. Mikvah kamahavu. So how much, how many, how much, how large is a mikvah? It holds our boyim saw. It holds 40 saw. Kiritanya, as we learn in a brisa, verachatz, the Pasuk actually reads as follows. Verachatz bamayim is kol bisaro, that he shall bathe in water his entire body or his entire flesh. So we learn from that Pasuk, bime mikvah kol bisaro ibabamayim, in water, teaches me, the may mikvah kol bisaro, that that uh, that it has. B- b- I'm sorry. Bamayim teaches me b'me mikvah that you have to use the water of a mikvah. Kol b'saro teaches me that mayim shekol gufa olin bahen that you have to be able to immerse your entire body in this water uh, this water receptacle in order for you to be considered to be purified by a mikvah. The kamahen and how much water has to be contained? What's the vo- minimal volume of water in order for a mikvah to be kosher? Ama al ama barum shalosh amos. That it's uh, how much, how much water. What's the volume to contain a person's body, a a a receptacle that is one by one, amos and three amos tall. That's what can contain a person's body. So the shiru chachamim may mikvah ar saw, and the chachamim uh, calculated that that amount as being forty saws of water. And it's approximately, I don't remember the exact number of gallons, but it's uh, 200. 200 gallons approximately yeah. is the measurement of how much water you need in a mikvah. So now, kama havaluhu, so now let's, 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 let's do the math now. Chamesh mea garmidi, how much did Shlomo's pool have? Well, when you think about it, it was five amas high, and it measures ten in diameter, so ten... If it, let's imagine it's squared off for a second, so it's 10 by 10 by 5 would be, would be the measurement. So 10 by 10 by 5 would give you a volume of 500 cubic amas. Okay, 500... Yeah, the, the if, it, if it was squared off, it would be 500... The equation of volume is, is pi r squared. Pi r so squared. Okay, but well we're not going to pi. It's 500... Gumar is not yeah. using that cheshman, right? But we're, instead we're using... The, uh, we're using the, um, we're imagining that it's squared off, so it's 10 by 10 by 5, so it's 500 cubic amas of water. Now, let's loss maya, maya, so now, take 300 out of that 500, and you've got 100 mikvos, because remember, how much is a kosher mikvah? 1 by 1 by 3. So a, a kosher mikvah is 3 cubic amas of water. So take the first 300 cubic amas of that 500 cubic ama pool, and you've got 100 mikvos. That's the first part. Lameya v'chamshin, chamshin. So if you, now if you have uh, 150 of the remaining 200, 
you've now got how many mikvos? 50 mikvos. So now, if you want to get to 150 kosher mikvos in the pool of Shlomo, how many cubic amas do you need? Ba'ar b'meya v'chamshin sagya. All you need is 450 cubic amas in order to, if you're telling me that the measurement of a minimal measurement of a kosher mikvah is three cubic amas, so then all you need is 450 cubic amas to get to 150 kosher mikvahs because it's a three to one ratio. Okay? So the Gemara's question is, why do you have to tell me that you have 500 cubic amas of water, all you need is 450 cubic amas of water? Answers the Gemara, the obvious answer is that honey mili bi ribua, but yam sha'asa shlomo agul hayam. That's only if you have a squared off pool of water. But Shlomo HaMelech's pool was circular. And because it's circular, it's much smaller than a square. It's not 10 by 10. It's 10 diameter, but a circle. So now the question is, so mehti, kama meruba yeser al ha'agul. So what's the difference? How much smaller is a circle than a square? So ravia la'ar, ravia. It's a quarter smaller. Now, we're, we'll, it's... it's, uh, it's 75% is 200 is 150. Right, so... The square is smaller. Than no, you're, ta- you're, you're looking at the square inside the circle. We're talking about a square that is outside the circle, where it touches the circle at four tangents. Okay? Got it? So, so if, it's, so if the square is a quarter larger than the circle, so la arba meya meya. So now let's so now let's so now let's do the math, okay? So instead of there being for 300, you have 100 mikvos. So now you need 400 cubic amas to make 100 mikvos using the using the ratio that we just that we just described. And la meya esrim v'chamisha. And for the 100 remaining, which would make us to 500 cubic amas you'd get 25 mikvos. So the, for the first 400 cubic amas, you yield 100, uh, 100 mikvos. For the remaining 100 cubic amas, since you have to divide by 4 instead of dividing by 3, you get now 25 mikvos. So now, honey, meya ve'esrim v'chamisha havaluhu. So now you end up short. How can you tell me that Shlomo's pool yielded 150 mikvos? We're using our mathematical equation. Now you only end up with 125 mikvos in a circular pool. So Tony Rami Bar Yecheskel Yam Sha'os Shlomo Shalosh Amos Tachtonios or Tachtonos Mirubos Ushtayim Agulos Ushlaim Elionos Agulos. The answer is, and this is a big chiddush, is that Shlomo's pool changed shapes um, going up vertically. The first bottom three amos high was square shaped, and the two amos on top were circular. And using that mathematical equation, which we're not going to run into, we're not going to do the permutation, you just have to take the Gemara's word for it, then you would end up with 500, uh, well, no, you're not going to have 500, but you're going to end up with 150 mikvos, because you'll end up with exactly at the amount of volume that you need in order to yield 150, which is basically going to be 450, uh, 450 cubic amas, you'll end up with that, with that. So the Gemara now says, I can understand why you can't tell me that the bottom was circular and the top was square because it says in the Pasuk that the top of the pool was circular. <coughs> so that makes sense. But why can't you say that only the top ama was circular and the bottom part was, the bottom four amas height were square? What makes you say that the top two amas were circular? Lo salkadaitach, no, that you also could not entertain. Dechsiv alpayim bas yochil. Because the Pasuk says that it held 2,000 bats. Now, what is a bat? So, bas kama havya, shalosh sa'im. A bas is three sa's. Okay? Dechsiv me'eser habas min hakor de havu. So, it's because there's a pas- another Pasuk in Yecheskel that says that 10 bats yields a kor is equal to a core. Now we know that a core is 30 saws, and if a core is 30 saws and there are 10 bots to the core, then a bot is 3 saws. Okay? So we know that if the Pusik says that there were 2,000 bots, how many saws are in the mikvah, are in the Shlomo's pool? 6,000 saws. So, the Havalehu, Shita Alfi, Gurivi. So now you have 6,000 saws of water in Shlomo's pool. 
and the hak siv machazik batim. Uh, so, so the Gemara says, and in order to be able to hold six thousand um, saas of water, you need exactly the top two amas to be circular and the bottom three amas to be square. If you were to have the bottom four amas to be square and only the top ama to be circular, you would end up with actually more than than six thousand saas, and um, and because you can't come up with more than 6,000 saws based on what the Pusik tells you, you have to have the permutation exactly the way we've described. And you can go through the math yourself if that's what, if that's what tickles your fancy. Now, the Gemara says, v'hakasiv machasik batim shaloshes alafim. So, I, but there's another Pusik in Divrei Hayomim that doesn't say that it held 2,000 bots. It says that it held 3,000 bots. So, how do you reconcile the difference between the two? Hahu l'gudsha answers the Gemara, that Pusik, when it says that it was able to hold 3,000 bots, was talking about if you were, were to imagine Shlomo's pool as holding dry measure instead of water, then you would have a heaping measure of grain, let's say, using this as a silo instead of a pool, and a heaping measure would be able to be much larger in volume than just the level measure going only up to the height of the walls. So Amar Abay Yishma Mina Haigud Shetlasa Avi. We learn from here that um, a heaping measure is a third more than a level measure. Now, really, it means to say it's fifty percent more because um, it, because three thousand is fifty percent more than two thousand. But in the terms of the Gemara, it's a third more using the total. Right, using the total. Yeah. So Utsanan Nami. We have a Mishnah that supports this principle, too, that a heaping measure is 50% more than a level measure because we have a Mishnah that says, says the tevo migdal kaveras hakash v'kaveras hakanim ubor sfina alexandris. We have different kinds of large containers that are meant to remain stationary because of their bulkiness and because of the difficulty to pick them up because they're normally used to hold uh, large volumes of either liquid or solid. Even though they have a bottom, and therefore theoretically they could be picked up from off the ground, as long as they hold a minimum of 40 saw of liquid measure, which is two cores of dry measure, and you see the ratio of 40 saw to two cores is a 50% higher ratio, two cores is 50% more than 40 saw. Then to Horan, then they are tar. They're not makabel tuma because they're not called the kli that's meant to be moved. Only a movable kli can be makabel tuma. So you see from this la- from this language of the Mishnah that a heaping measure is 50 percent more than a f- than a level measure. Let's go on to the next Mishnah. Those of you who love math should would want to spend a lot more time on this. They already figured but, it. Out. But for, but for the 99 percent of the rest of us, we're going to go right. The next Mishnah, lechayayin sheamru. Gov han asaret fachim virochvan vaovyan kolshu. Now the lechi we've talked about in the previous mission. We talked about the minimal width of a korah, which was one tefach. What's the minimal <laughs> width of a lechi and the, the, the height of a lechi? So it's got to be at least ten fachim high, but its width and its depth do only have to be a kolshu. It doesn't have to have any minimal amount. So Reb Yossi, Omer Rechav and Gimel Tvachim, Reb Yossi says no. It's width, the amount that it has to extend into the entranceway, has to be three, three Tvachim. And we, we had seen Reb Yossi's position previously. The Gemara now says, L'chayayin she'amru chulei, Le'ma t'nan stama karebi, Elize ezer da'amr l'chayayin ba'inan. That why did the Mishnah choose to say the word lechi in the plural? It, uh, this implies that the Mishnah is going according to Rebbe Eliezer, who says that every Mavoi needs two lechis, not one lechi, like the Chachamim said. So the Gemara says, Lo. No, you can't deduce that from the fact that lechi is written in the plural here, because my lechayayin, lechayayin da alma, because when the Mishnah says lechis, it means lechis in the veldt. Lechis out there, in all Mavois in the world, how big do they have to be? It's got nothing to do with a lechi in a, part- in a particular, in a particular uh, Mavoi. So ihachi koronami nisni koros, or my koros koros da alma. So then, but be consistent. If that's the way you're going to describe lechis of the velt, then describe koros of the velt, and you should have said the word koros in the plural by the previous mission as well. The Gemara says hachi koros. No, the difference is as follows. O son lechayayin shenech luku bahen Rebbe Eliezer vechachamim govan asaret fachim verochan vaovian kolshim. That what the Mishnah means is 
that we know that there's a machlokas between Rabbi Eliezer and the Chachamim. Rabbi Eliezer says you need two lechis, the Chachamim say you need one lechi. So that regarding those lechis that are debated by the Chachamim and Rabbi Eliezer, again, we are referring to a specific mavui now, but at least we're able to say that it, this, this topic of debate are lechis. Because for the Chachamim, <coughs> you need one of the two lechis. And for Rabbi Eliezer, you need two out of the two lechis in order for the Mavu to be kosher. So we're not, so the, basically this mission is not paskening like either Tana, and it's basically saying that those lechis that are the subject of debate, how tall does the lechi have to be? So that's why you cannot adduce that our mission is going according to either. Now, the Kama, so the Kama Kolshu, that's really the question. How much is a Kolshu? When we say that it can be a, in any minimal amount, what is that minimal amount? So Tani Rebbe Chia, Afilu Kichuta Sarbal, even like the thread of, uh, even like a piece of fabric thread, meaning it can be very, 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 very uh, tiny. Tana, Asa Lechi Lechatsi Mavoi, Einlo Elechatsi Mavoi. So the Mishnah, there's a Brisa that says that normally, you know, you're supposed to make a Lechi at the entrance way to the Mavoi. Let's say, instead of putting your lechi at the entrance to the mavoi, you walk several feet into the mavoi, and then attach your lechi to the wall there. Right? So, let's say you put it in at the halfway distance into the mavoi. So, all you have, says the b'risa, is the half of a mavoi where you can carry. You can't carry in the other half of the mavoi. So, the Gemara says, pshita. That should be fairly obvious that you're not going to be able to carry on the portion on the outside of the lechi, that should be fairly obvious, so what's the point? The Chiddush is, is that at least you have half the mavi where you're allowed to carry because Lamaista you put up a lechi. But the Gemara says, Hanami Pshita, shouldn't that also be obvious? You put up a lechi, so what's the deal? So, Now, you might have thought that the Chachamim would not allow you to do, put up such a, such a lechi. They would say no. You either put up the lechi at the entrance to let you carry in the whole thing, or you can't carry in the entire mavoi because uh, uh, just putting up a lechi in half of a mavoi would we have to fear that maybe a guy will carry past the lechi. So kamash malan that at least you know that you can have a half a mavoi where you can carry as long as you put up the lechi at some point. So amar rava asa lechi le mavoi veigbiu min akarka shlosha o shehifligu min akolso shlosha lo asa velo kolum. Rava now says another halacha about a lechi. You make a lechi for your mavoi and instead of um, you take a stick and put it to the side of the wall, but you elevate it above the ground three tvachim, or you distance it from the wall three tvachim. So since you haven't done it the proper fashion, and it's uh, and uh, then it's it, it's was, if it's th- more than three tvachim away, then it's no good. And afilu the Rebbe Shimon Gamliel da Amar Amrinan Lavud Hani Milu Lamaila Olamata Kevin Da Havya Mechitza Shagidim Bokin Baloka Amar. And this goes to what Alan was suggesting. This is true according. Uh, this is true uh, even according to Rabbi Shimon Gamliel. That even according to Shimon Gamliel, who says that Lavud is four Tvachim and not three Tvachim, he would agree that in, when you're trying to create a Mechitza, which is what Alechi is trying to accomplish, at least according to one opinion, you're not creating a Mechitza if it's three Tvachim off the ground over three Tvachim distance away from the wall, because now animals can squeeze through either, either in between or under, and therefore even Rabbi Shimon Gamliel would agree that the issue here is not lavud. The issue over here is what, uh, if is it is it creating a mechitza? And it's not creating a mechitza because a mechitza is a partition, is a divider, is a barrier, and this does not constitute a, a legal barrier. Rabbi Yossi Omer Rechavin Gimel Tfachim. Rabbi Yossi says that he holds that the width of the lechi has to be three tfachim wide. So Omer Rabbi Yossi, if Omer Rabbi Yehuda Omer Shmuel, ain halacha k'Rabbi Yossi lo behilmi v'lo belechayayim. So these rabbis said in the name of Shmuel, that the halacha is not like Rabbi Yossi, neither when it comes to salt water, nor when it comes to lechis. There was a halacha in Maseches Shabbos, where there was a machlokas between the Chachamim and Rabbi Yossi, as to whether you're allowed to prepare salt water on Shabbos. Rabbi Yossi says you're not allowed to prepare any amount of salt water, even a minimal amount, because there's a prohibition of pickling on Shabbos. And to, uh, so, so the rabbis forbade even preparing salt water that could be used for pickling is us or to prepare. But they said if there's a minimal amount, then you're allowed to prepare it. And Rabbi Yossi says even a minimal amount you're not allowed to prepare. So we don't paskin like that chumr of Rabbi Yossi, neither buy salt water, nor when it comes to the width of a lechi. We paskin like the chachamim to be mekel. So Amr le'i Rafuna bar chinana 
Behilmi Amratlan, Bilochayain Lo Amratlan. So Rav Huna says back to Rav Yosef, he says, you know, you taught us previously that we don't paskin like Rav Yosef when it comes to the salt water. But you never taught us before that we don't paskin like Rav Yosef by the, by the width of the lechi. So Maishna behilmi de pligi rabbanon alay lechayayin ami pligi rabbanon alay. So the question is, well, why should we think to paskin like Rav Yosef by lechi? Just like by salt water, the Chachamim disagree with him and are mekel. Say the same thing over here. The Chachamim disagree with Rabbi Yossi as far as the width of a lechi and are mekel. So why can't we be mekel here as well? Amr le, shiny lechayayin, mishum dekoi rebi kavase. The answer is, is because we established a couple of pages ago that Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi paskins like Rabbi Yossi, that the width of a lechi has to be three tvachim. If you recall, it was the case of the small chatzar connected to the large chatzar, and we had said that the difference in size between the large chatzar and the small chatzar is only one ama, which is three tvachim of flank in the large chatzar, which is what permits you to carry. It seems from there that Rebbe, Rebbe holds that you need to have a three tefach lechi on either side in order for it to be considered to be a legitimate flank for a chatzar wall, and therefore the same thing would apply to a mavo. Rav Rechume Masni Hachi, and Rav Rechume taught the story as well. Amar Rav Yehuda Berei de Rav Shmuel Bar Shilas Mishmei de Rav, that it was not Rav Yosef who taught this in the name of Shmuel, but rather Rav Yehuda Berei de Rav Shmuel in the name of Rav taught, Ein Halacha Kareb Yosi Lo Behilmi Velo Belochayayim. That we paskin neither like we paskin not like Rav Yosi, neither in the case of salt water nor in the case of lechi. So Amar Le Amart. So um, that. Um, so the the um, um, Rav Ruchume, So I guess uh, Rav Ruchume asked. I'm not sure who asked who. So Amar Le Amart Amar Lehu Lo. So and he said no. I never said it. So I think this is. I think they they asked Rav. Rav, did you ever say this? And Rav responded, No, I never said that. We don't paskin like Rav Yosi. So Amar Rav Oha Elokim Amra. So Rav says, by God I do declare that not only did Rav say it, but I actually studied it from his mouth. Why then did he retract and say that we have to be machmer like Rav Yossi? Because Rav Yossi is considered to be a man of great depth who is able to analyze things very, very accurately. And therefore, if he said it, we have to reckon with it even when the Chachamim disagree with him. So then finally the question they asked uh, Abaya is, what's the final halacha? When it comes to a lechi, can we go like the chachamim that it could be a kol shehu? Or do we have to say, be, say that it's got to be three tvachim wide? So puk chazi mayama dovar. So Abaya gives his famous answer, which appears other places in Shas, and he says, go out and see what people are doing. You know, you have to trust the Jewish people. If the Jewish people have been doing things like this for, for generations, then that in itself is a reliable, te- a reliable testimony as to what the halacha is. Ika damasni la aha. Some say that Abaya made that statement on, the, on a different halacha, which was, that if a person is drinking water because he's thirsty, meaning that he's not drinking it for medicinal purposes, he's drinking it because he's thirsty, he has to make a bracha, a bracha rishona, he has to make a shahakol. Rabbi Tarfan Omer Bari Nefashos Rabbos Vechasron Al Kol Nashavaros and Rabbi Tarfan says not only does he have to make a bracha Rishana but he also has to make a bracha Achron of Bari Nefashos. So Amalei Rav Chanan Le Abaye Hilchas Amais Rav Chanan asked Abaye So Taka What's the halacha when it comes to drinking water? Amalei Puk Chazim Ayam Adavar Go out and see what people are doing and since people make a bracha Rishana and a bracha Achrona that's the final halacha. You all have a wonderful Shabbos.